today, Pastor um, has been taking us through the book of Philippians, um, and the theme of Philippians is joy. So if you want to turn in your Bibles in just a minute, we're going to go to Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18, so you can turn in your Bibles there. But the theme of the, theme of the book is joy, and if you've missed, I'm going to catch you up just a little bit. We find Paul, who's the author of the book, he's written this book to the church at Philippi, and um, Paul is an amazing character. Uh, he comes to Christ in a dynamic way and, and goes about Asia Minor and, um, and Europe and just starts planting churches. And, and they just explode. They just, everywhere he goes, there's a church. Boom, boom, boom. And then, and then but with that, he's changing the culture. And, and they're calling him all kinds of um, heretical things. And, and, and it, with it comes a lot of persecution. Uh, Paul, he finds himself shipwrecked. He finds himself getting bit by a snake. For preaching the gospel, he has to leave town in the middle of the night, skip, jumping over walls uh, to, to avoid a beating. At one point, a couple points, he's left for dead. He gets shipwrecked. I say that one already. Uh, I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, but in, in, the book of, in, this, in this place, when he writes the book of Philippians, he finds himself in jail. He finally gets to Rome, the capital of the world at the time. He finally gets to Rome, and, he, and um, it's his chance to share the gospel in this in this place, and he finds himself brought there in chains, and he's under house arrest. And <clears throat> so Paul would have a reason to complain, if anybody did. I, I complain kind of regularly. I complain because it's too hot. I complain because I have to get up too early. I complain because I have to get up, period. I get up. Uh, I, get up I, I, have all, I find all kinds of reasons to complain. But, but if, if someone had a real reason to complain, it would be Paul. He's, he's in jail and actually facing death. Like, it's likely that the outcome of, of this uh, prison sentence, the end of it, is going to be facing martyrdom. And he knows this. And yet this book, and yet this book, the theme, joy. Joy. He says, rejoice with me. Again, I say rejoice. He says, rejoice with me, brothers, about this. Rejoice about that. All through the book, it's joy. Uh, why? How? And that's what we've been studying it's been a good study. Um, so turn with me. Now let's read this, this passage we're going to have today. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. It says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that you may come, become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. Listen to that language. In which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. In order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith. I am glad, and I rejoice with you all, and so too, and so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would help us through, the, through uh, this word, that it would sink deep into our hearts, and that you would help us become a joyful people, a people less prone to arguing, a pro people less prone to complaining, a people more inclined to lean in to the good work that you're doing in our life, and do it with joy in our hearts. We give you thanks for that. In your name we pray. Everybody says. You can do better. Everybody says. Okay, I'll just make sure. I lost you already. All right. So, um, listen, um, I have uh, this gym membership. I bought it a couple years ago. I know. <clears throat> I know. The obvious question, right? If I've had a gym membership for two years ago, why am I wearing my shirt untucked? That's the question. That's the question. I have, I have this gym membership from a couple of years ago, and I went, and I, um, a couple times, and I worked out. Don't, I did. I, <clears throat> I worked out, and I did it a couple times, and then some other things started becoming my priority. It, it was a 24-7 gym. You know the one right down here, uh, Experiment Station, right down in the corner? Uh, it's convenient to my house. It's convenient to my work. It's convenient to the kids' school. Like, I'm driving past that all the time. I got no excuses, except this, except this. Um, I found that um, I found some other priorities in the general vicinity. There's this big Zach snack that, that I like more than going to the gym. 
Yeah? And there's this $3 double, double cheeseburger deal at Burger King. Also, higher priority for me than the gym. And there's the Publix and the Papa John's and the Domino's. There are multiple reasons on that corner for me to skip the gym. Multiple reasons. And, um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, a couple, a couple uh, I was about a year into it. And I was thinking, you know, this isn't really working. I'm probably not going to re-sign up. And uh, Felix, he's my friend. Felix at the gym. <clears throat> I see him once in a while. He says to, he calls me up. He says, hey, Jason, your membership is about to expire. Guess what? We're going to give you two years for the same price that you paid for one year. I said, oh, that's too good to pass up. Sign me up. This is what I need because I need a contract that's going to make me skinny. I'm going to sign that contract, and I'm going to be able to tuck in my shirts at church. It's going to be fantastic. Well, so I signed the contract. I'm still not tucking. Because you know what? It's not the signing of the contract that, that gets you in shape, right? It's, it's the work that comes after that. It, it's not the signing of the contract. It's not the intention. It's not the moment that, that gets you skinny, right? That, move, that, that changes your image, that molds you into something else. It's the work you do uh, on a consistent basis after that, right? So this is the point of today's sermon, uh, today's talk. Paul says, um, continue, he says, continue to work out your salvation. you got to do the work. That's the point. Continue to work out your salvation. What does this mean? <clears throat> what is Paul referring to here? He's not talking about the gym. Don't worry. Uh, thank goodness I wouldn't have made it. But um, he says, he's not talking about the gym. And he's also not talking about ensuring your salvation. He says to work out your salvation. Don't get confused. You, you can't earn your salvation. You've heard, me say, you've heard us say this around grace. If you've heard us say it once, you've heard us say it a thousand times. You cannot earn your salvation. Grace is a gift of God. Salvation is a gift of God by grace through faith. That's it. Can't add anything else to it. You can't do anything to ever become worthy of it. You can't do enough good works to ever ensure that it won't go away. You have nothing to do with with obtaining salvation for yourself. Nothing. God chooses you, and you accept it, and you are his. It's his work. That work, when you claim the Lord as your life, the, the, uh, the Lord as your Lord, and you repent of your sins, and you say, I'm yours, Lord, that work is done. You're a new creation. Everybody say amen. amen. All right. So we got that cleared up. There's nothing more for you to do. You'll never do enough for it to be said that you earned your salvation. So what is the work he's talking about? He says, continue to work out your salvation. If it's not that, what is it? Well, think of it like this. <clears throat> it's the work of your salvation. It's the work because I'm saved. All right? So I call Jesus the Lord of my life. What does that mean? I signed the contract. What does it mean I'm supposed to do now? What, is, what am I going to do? Salvation happens the moment we call him Lord. What do I do? If I call him Lord, then how I interact with my, the people around me, my relationships, how I interact with my things, how I inter go about my day, all of those things are going to be impacted. See, there's nothing. When you call the Jesus the Lord of your life, it doesn't mean the Lord of your Sunday. It doesn't mean the Lord of just your Sunday morning. It doesn't mean I'm not going to cuss. It doesn't mean, you know, that we have all these things that, it mean, that we think it might mean, but really what it means is he's the Lord of your whole life. Your whole life. He's the Lord of your mouth. He's the Lord of your budget. He's the Lord of your relation. Listen, if the Lord's the Lord of your life, it's going to impact the way you treat your spouse. You're going to treat them with respect and patience and consistent love. It's going to impact the way you treat your kids. You're going to stop antagonizing them. I need to work on that one. I really enjoy antagonizing my kids. I think I said that before. But you're going to stop it. God, help me. You're going to stop it. You're going to stop antagonizing your children and provoking them to anger. Instead, you're going to consistently be loving them and moving them and, and helping them grow up to be great adults, right? That's what you're going to do. If, you're, if you call Jesus the Lord of your life, it's going to impact your budget. It's going to impact your budget. Your checkbook's going to reflect it. Because now, no longer, am I looking for ways to spend my money to make me happy? That's not the first goal. Now the first goal of my budget is to find ways to help other people. Christians are generous people. Jesus was generous. Christians are marked by generosity. That's who we ought to be. 
So the first question when we approach all of this stuff is, how does it, what does it mean that Jesus is the Lord of this area? We call it, so what is the work of working out our salvation? It's learning what is the expressions of my faith. How do I express my faith in every area? And it has to, it has to affect every area. So that's a hard thing. It's a hard thing. But good news is in the same passage. Good news. Look with me at verse 13. It says, It tells us that we're not on our own. We're not doing this work on our own. It says, it is God who works in you to will and act according to his good purpose. It is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. This is good, you guys. I don't think you're catching me. Listen to this. It is God who works in you to will and act according to his good purpose. Now, wait a minute. Didn't we just say that that Paul just said, that you're supposed to do the work. He says, continue to work out your salvation. So is he supposed to do it or does God do it for me? Wh- which is it? Is, is God supposed to do it or, or for me or do I do it? The answer is yes. It's yes. It is. It's yes. God does the work. He does it in you and he does it through you. And you have to own it and make it part of, and make it part of what you are doing, of what you are. So here's an, here's a, here's an illustration. My, <clears throat> I was 14. We moved to Bakersfield, California from Michigan. Bakersfield is much, so Bakersfield is in a desert. <clears throat> it is literal desert, less than two inches of rain. I think we get, in Michigan, I don't think I ever saw three-digit temperatures. I don't, like the whole time I lived there, uh, we got about six weeks of 100-degree temperatures in Bakersfield. Um, I was hot the whole time I lived there. It was, just, it was just hot. They didn't have seasons. In Michigan, they had summer, they had fall, then it followed by winter, and then they had spring, and they were distinct. It was beautiful. The winter was long, but it's okay. Uh, you move to California, it goes hot, not so hot. Hot, not so hot. Those are, that's the temperatures, that's the seasons in in Bakersfield. Well, so I get a job. I'm 14. I'm, I'm thinking I need to start saving some money for some car insurance. I want to drive my dad's cool car around. And so I get a job at the church, and I'm the vacuumer. Like, that's my official title. I'm just vacuuming. Uh, if you've ever vacuumed between pews, it's not easy work. I did that. I cleaned some bathrooms. What I loved about it, it was inside. It was usually in the evening. I didn't have to be out in the heat. It was great. So <clears throat> then uh, summer's coming. And my boss comes to me and he says, hey, Jason, guess what we're going to do? I'm going to retask you for the summer. You have some time during the day, right? I said, yeah. I was nervous because I like what I'm doing. He says, this is what we're going to do. Pastor wants us to pour a bunch of concrete around the back. We've got to pour some paths. We've got to pour some walkways. I said, I'm 14. What am I going to say? Like, I don't have a union. I said, okay. <clears throat> I said, okay. We're going we're gonna to pour some concrete. So I showed up, and it was awful. I thought it was going to be bad, and it was worse. It was really bad. It was, it was, it was hot. It was my back hurt. I, wasn't, I was not ready, prepared for this, but I did the work. <clears throat> At the end of the summer, my mom says to me, hey, Jason, how did you like, how did you like pouring concrete? I'm getting to a point. You, you still with me? All right. My mom says, how did you like pouring concrete? I said, well, I hated it. It was not so fun. It wasn't great. He goes, she goes, ah. And then she said, she said, Jason, um, have you thought about going to college? And I thought, that's a strange two questions in a row. I don't see the relation. Well, come to find out, my mom had gone to my boss and said, hey, I think maybe you should have Jason on that cement crew this summer. (laughs) See, this was my mom working in me to act and to will to go to college. (laughs) You understand what's happening. You understand. See, she could have just, she, she could have just said, Jason, you need to go to college. You need to go to college. She could have just, but instead she wanted me to want to go to college. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? She wanted me to want to, and boy, did I. Boy, did I. At the end of that summer, like, I, I signed up for anything that was inside. College sounded wonderful. I knew that would assure me an inside position. So, <clears throat> this is what God does. This is what we're talking about. You're not on your own in the doing of the work. You're not on your own. God is working within you to act, but also to want to act. He's putting situations, he's putting you 
in situations that are sometimes uncomfortable. And boy, aren't we quick to complain. I have to confess, there was a lot of complaining that summer. And I probably should confess that even now, when I'm uncomfortable, when things aren't going the way I think they ought to go, when I feel like somebody slighted me or didn't respect me the way I thought they ought to, I'm, I'm, I'm still pretty quick to complain. But probably I should recognize that God is always at work in my life. And in every situation, in every situation, I should recognize that situation as God working in my life to will and to act. And that the purpose of this situation is not to make me, it's not just to make me uncomfortable, but it's to build me into a, a new creature. I, I already am saved. That work is done. But there's a work to do in my life to mold me and make me into his image. You get it? So we're not on our own. We have to do the work, and we need to embrace it. But we're not on our own. God is working in us to will and to act. That good? That's good. So it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. I love that. So why is it important then? Why, why did Paul take the time to talk about this? Why does Paul feel the need to remind us of this? If we, because if we, put our, if we put our lives, if we sign the contract, we sign the contract to go to the gym and we don't ever go back, do we ever look more like what we want to look like? Are we ever stronger? Can we ever do the things we want to do that we couldn't do before? No, we can't. In the same way, when you come to Jesus and you say, okay, Jesus, you're Lord, you're Lord, but I'm going to stay over here. And he's saying, but I need, and you, oh, no, it's fine, that's fine. You're Lord, but, you can't Lord, but, you can't. You have to, you have to lean into the work and make the work of God your work. You have to own it. New creatures have new natures, and they're going to need to learn, learn, lean into a new pattern for your life. Amen? All right, all right. So that's good. Um, so that's, we have to do the work. Number two, how do you do the work? How do you do the work? Look with me at verse 17. Verse 17 says, the sacrifice and service coming from your faith. If you're leaning into the work, there's going to be sacrifice, there's going to be service. There's going to be sacrifice, there's going to be service. You're going to be moving out of the selfish arena and into the selfless arena. We've got to be prepared to make sacrifices for serving one another. We've got to, make, we've got to be looking for opportunities to sacrifice for someone else to prefer one another. We have to. Look with me at verse 12. How do we do the work? It says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Continue to work it out with fear and trembling. Doesn't that sound encouraging? Oh, brothers, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's not nearly as pretty as you're going to shine like the stars of the universe. <clears throat> but it's the work that makes you shine like the stars. It is. You have to you need to approach the work of your salvation with fear and trembling. Why is that? Why do you think he chose the words fear and trembling? I really didn't get that until this week. It took me a long time to kind of figure out what in the world fear and trembling was. And it comes in the very next sentence. It comes in the very next sentence. It says, continue to work <clears throat> out your salvation, for it is God who works in you to will and act according to his good purpose. For it is God who works in you. So here's the thing about God. We like to talk about him, and it's true. God is love. There's nobody that loves you like God. There's nobody as good as God. It's true. There's nobody as faithful as God. And I'm not going to take anything away from that. That statement is absolutely true. God will never be anything but loving and faithful. But... Part of that is looking at where he's coming from. God is holy. You guys, we need to think about God's holiness a little bit more, I think. God is holy. When you look and you recognize that God is without sin. In fact, he's so holy, sin can't even enter his presence. This is the being we're talking about that is, at a will, that is working in you to will and to act. This is who he is. He's so holy, sin can't even be in his presence, and yet he loves me. And yet he loves me so much 
He signs me up to work cement for a summer. He knows me that good. He knows I need it that much, and he's that involved in my life. And so when you realize that that's the power that's working within me, that's the power that's loving me and molding me, then I ought to approach it with a little bit of fear and trembling. Does that make sense? He's so holy. He's so great. He's so strong that if he wants to work in my life and I'm going to let him, I ought to recognize there should be some fear. There ought to be some awe, some respect. Yeah? God is holy, you guys. We need to approach this work. We need to approach this with some fear and with trembling. So how do you do the work? Look at verse 14. Paul also gives us another hint about how to do the work. He says, verse 14, do everything. Everything he's been talking about. Do all of this stuff without what? Complaining and arguing. I need to work on verse 14. Maybe you do too. It's a good one to underline. I, li- I like to write in my Bible. It, it's good. You should. It's freeing. Just do it. Just write. Just underline it. It's good. Do everything without complaining and arguing. This is a tough one for me. I got to be honest. I, I continually have this struggle in myself about how I think people ought to treat me, about how things ought to go. I actually said to someone, I actually said to Stacy yesterday, I said, I just feel a little disrespected. And I thought, and then I, and then I went, I'm looking at this badge and I'm going, well, you goofus. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'm not feeling, that's all about me. That's all about me. That's because I'm thinking about me. I'm complaining and I'm arguing. You guys, it's impossible to be joyful while you are complaining and arguing. Your happiness gets sucked right out the, out the window when you're complaining and when you're arguing. When you're focused on yourself, it's really hard to be happy. It's really hard to be happy. We ought not be a bunch of, a bunch of individuals seeking our own benefit and moving towards God. We ought to be a group of unified people, unified by love of Jesus, but also unified by love for one another, walking towards Jesus. You guys, there's a lot of, there's a lot of forces at work right now, a lot of things going on in the world. There's a lot of just angst in the world in general, isn't there? And that's not just outside the church, it's inside the church too, but it ought not be so. It ought not be. When we come to the church, we ought to come uh, um, united by this one thing, our love for Jesus and our love for one another, and leave all this stuff, other stuff at the door. There's so many things we can get irritated about, and we let. And when we let that in, we're letting the enemy win. But if we can, what a stark contrast the church will be when we decide to be Defined the way, John, the way John defines us. He said, they will, know they, are, they will know you are Christians by what? Oh, yeah. That's right. By your love. No, by your love. <clears throat> they will know you're Christians by your love, you guys. That's how they'll know. That's how, the, that's how you'll be defined. What a stark contrast the church could be right now. Just think for a moment. Just think for a moment. If we decided when, when we're out and we're, and we're, we're, we're with, we're with one another or we're, we're with anyone else. But we refuse to be people who complain and argue. When we refuse to be people who pick up bitterness. When we refuse to be people who pick up strife and carry that forward. What a contrast we would be to the world. How attractive. Did you know Jesus is so compelling? Jesus is so attractive. And this is one of the reasons why. Can we agree together? Once again... Once again, wherever we're at, to not let the things outside to be divisive within the church. Let let it not separate. There's only one thing that matters when it comes to it. It's our love for Jesus. It's our love for one another. Amen? It's a especially good word right now. Thank you, Jason. Well done. And lastly, the joy of the work. We've talked about do the work. We've talked about how to do the work. Let's talk about the joy of the work. My, um, my, 
My first pastor, uh, his name's Brad Grams. I went to this little church in Fresno, California, and, uh, and he said, he, he, he watched me for a little while, and if any of you have done any work with me, you know this, that I can put a list together, put a team together, and we can accomplish something. We're going to go. If you hang around me, we're going to go. We don't stand around and talk very much. Um, we go. And um, from student arts to Uncle Phil's diner to worship team to, uh, you know, you probably didn't even notice. We painted in here while you all were taking your COVID vacation. We got a lot done. We get a lot done. Um, but that type of personality, my type of personality, I'll own it. My type of personality has a weakness. I sometimes am so busy going that I miss uh, people. I can. I'm just going to confess that. I miss people. Well, I've always been that way. My first pastor kind of noticed. And he said, hey, Jason, guess what? I'm going to add something to your portfolio. I said, oh, pastor, you got to see my calendar. I'm real busy. <laughs> buddy. Uh, <laughs> he, said, he said, this is what we're going to do. Um, we've got a food pantry, and we just need a staff person to, uh, to be in charge of it and just to kind of keep maintaining it. It's all set up. You just got to maintain it. And I said, well, what does that look like? He said, well, sometimes someone will come in, and uh, they'll need some food. And we live in sort of a poor part of town, and, and so this happens once, twice, three times a week. <clears throat> and um, they'll come in, they'll tell you your story, you'll pray with them, you'll check their identification, and you'll, you'll give them food, and that'll be it. And I said, well, pastor, that sounds like an ordeal. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if I have time for this. And he said, well, you know, it'll be good. It, it'll be good, and I really need you to do it. And I, I did it, and I confess, I did it with complaining. I, I mean, not out loud, because I'm a good person. I crack myself up. Not out loud, but in my heart, it irritated me. You guys, you should see my calendar. I line up my calendar. If somebody calls and says, hey, go, let's go to lunch, I'll say yes because I like to do that, but obviously. But, but, I, but I, move, I have to move something around. I, I book every moment. So when these people would come in, I'd be like, oh, you got to be kidding me. I only have an hour left in the day, and you want two hours right now. I don't have the time for this. And so they'd sit there, and they'd start pouring their heart out to me. I just, you know, I just, this happened, and this happened, because nobody comes in and says, I deserve food. They don't do that. When people come in, this is what they say. They say, I've had a hard time. I'm in real trouble, and I need help. Every single person I ever served there, that's the way they were. And I... I just said, so, so I'd sit there, and at first I was hard because I was irritated. This wasn't what I had planned for the day, you know? But real quickly, God broke that in me, and I started seeing people. I started seeing um, there's something more important than me going on here. And... Um, there was a moment when it changed from complaining to joy. There's a moment when it changed from, why do I have to do that? To God, this is the best thing I did all day. And then it, and then it changed from, from at first being, oh, okay, I'll make some time, and then, then I end up being joyful too. I, eventually, I started looking forward to when they would come in. I did, at the end of the week, I'd be like, Nobody came. Darn it. I'm missing out. Listen, there's all kinds of reasons for you to miss out on this joy. But they're usually centered around one thing, you, me. We're centered around our own agendas and desires. Becoming like Jesus means at times you're going to have to sacrifice something. He's following Jesus, he always asks something of you. It's the way you grow. He's always going to ask you to step in to a need. And it's going to cost you something. It's the way you grow. He's going to ask you to take something that you used to use for your own self, for your own happiness, 
is going to ask you to turn it and give it. That's going to be sacrifice. Goodness. <laughs> he didn't leave you empty. Jesus never just takes. <laughs> when you give something to Jesus, he fills you up with more than you knew you wanted, than you knew you needed. It's always worth it. It's always worth it. Today, let's join together and commit ourselves to the work because he's worth it. You'll never get back less than what he gives you. It's always worth it. Let's commit ourselves to leaving behind complaining, leaving behind arguing, approaching the work of God with fear and trembling, with respect and awe and joyfulness. Oh, don't get me wrong. To this day, when God starts a new work in my life, the initial response is still, but God, I still get irritated. But the quicker I can remind myself of this, that it's the work of God in me to will and to want, to act according to his good purpose. And then, guess what, you guys, will shine like the stars. Will shine like the stars in the universe, Paul says, shine like the stars in the universe, holding out the word of life. Guess what happens when the church shines like the stars in the darkness against the, against the backdrop of a crooked and depraved generation? Guess what happens? They see Jesus. They don't even see you. And Jesus is compelling. Jesus is attractive. You want to see fruit in your life. Let him work in you. Be joyful. Don't complain. Leave it behind. And we will shine like stars. And people will come and they will know. And then guess what? They'll start their own walk. And they'll start doing the work. And the light gets brighter. It's a beautiful story. It's a beautiful thought. Amen?